Okay, amazing. So I think we are live. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to this live Q&A um, and webinar. My name is Liz Eggleston. I work on Course Report, which is a resource for finding the coding boot camp that's right for you. So Course Report has the most complete directory of boot camps around the world. You can use it to find schools that fit all of your needs. Um, check our blog for interviews um, with students and instructors and founders from boot camps across the world. Um, we've got application tips, other resources, some cool research about the industry and the market um, overall as well. So if you're watching this webinar tonight, then you are probably in different stages of a career change. Maybe you're starting to research, um, doing your research on like learning to code, switching careers. Maybe you have an idea for a product uh, and you want to build it yourself. Um, and one of the first questions that you have to tackle is what programming language should you learn first? Um, and two of the most popular programming languages, especially first languages, are Ruby and Python. So I'm really excited for this webinar tonight because we are going to do a deep dive into both languages. And helping us tackle this subject is Ben Neely, who is a curriculum developer at Block which is an online boot camp. So they will match you with a mentor like Ben. Um, and then they have courses in full stack development, UX, UI design, um, all sorts of other digital skills as well. Um, so Ben is the perfect uh, person to be here tonight, answer all of our questions, take us through both languages. We're really excited. So in tonight's webinar, like I said, we're going to cover Ruby and Python. Um, and we'll do it in that order. So you can ask questions throughout the next 30, 45 minutes, and we will do our best to answer all of them. Um, maybe you've heard that one language, Ruby or Python, is like better for beginners, but you're not totally sure. Maybe you have a specific project or even like a specific job that you want in mind, um, and you don't know which technology would be best for that goal, uh, feel free to ask all of those questions tonight. Um, ben has experience working uh, at jobs in Rails and in Python, so he is the perfect person to answer all of these questions. Um, so like most of our webinars, this is going to be a uh, interactive. So use the Q&A app in Hangouts, um, which should be on the left side of your screen. Um, or you can always tweet at Course Report with your questions about boot camps, about block, about specific languages, um, rumors that you've heard that you want confirmed. Um, and with that, I think we're going to try and get started. Actually, finally, we have um, one last thing is that Course Report has an exclusive scholarship for Block that's live right now. So if you enter the code CR500, um, you'll get $200 off your first Block apprenticeship. So with that, I think we're going to try and get started. So Ben, why don't you first just like introduce yourself, tell us how you got to Block, and while you do that, I'm going to try and share my screen so that we can um, all see the wonderful deck that Ben has put together. Yeah, thanks for that great introduction. Um, I've been at Block for um, over two and a half years now. Um, I have been a developer, um, primarily a web developer, but also doing, um, uh, but doing, uh, doing Python, doing Ruby, doing uh, Rails, and doing Django. So those have been kind of the, the four areas that I've really done a lot of, uh, I have a lot of experience in, in my pre-Block career. Um, I joined Block about two and a half years ago as a mentor. Um, I mentored a large number of students at Block, I think around 30 or 35. Um, and then about uh, last November, I actually came on board Block full-time as a curriculum developer. So now I'm part of our team of people who writes all of our curriculum full-time. So we do uh, all of our curriculum in-house. And uh, that's my full-time job now, and it's fantastic. Um, I think that's a really unique, cool part about Block is that you create all of the content that students are learning in-house. It's all um, you know, sort of unique to Block. That's like a huge value add. Um, and I love that you started as a mentor and then got like absorbed into the actual business. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's been a really fantastic ride. There's, it's just a whole group of amazing people. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's what really got me hooked to is that, you know, we write everything in house, you know, we're got a team that's constantly working on that. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Okay, cool. So I am going to um, put my present from my screen. Ben, just confirm with me that you can see the presentation in full screen, right? Yep. Okay, sweet. That's okay, great. so that is Ben. That is his email. Um, he is a curriculum developer at Block. Uh, so 
Ben is going to go, actually, maybe before that, let's let's skip to the glossary for just a second so that Ben can give us just like a quick rundown of the terms that we might use in this presentation. Um, and also remember that in addition to these, the Q&A app is there for you. So if there are words or like concepts that Ben goes over in the presentation that you don't understand, let us know so that we can make sure to explain those. Um, ben, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, so um, we've got a couple different uh, a couple different terms here. Um, the the first one that actually doesn't have a definition next to it is called is a language. Uh, that's kind of what we're talking about in, on a on a large scale here. Python and Ruby are both examples of programming languages. Um, and at its simplest, a programming language is just a uh, set of rules for giving the, a computer instructions. And different programming languages are designed around different philosophies. Um, and there are there is there is hundreds, if not thousands, of them at this point. Um, Python and Ruby are just two fairly prominent, fairly popular ones. Um, a, the next thing in there is, is, is an interpreter. An interpreter is a program that reads and executes code. So basically this takes your code this, this, the, that you wrote during, with a programming language and, and allows the computer to run it. Um, both Ruby and Python are interpreted languages, so they're not, um, there's languages that are compiled, so they have to be translated for the computer to use, and there's languages that are interpreted, so they're just run right away. Both Ruby and Python fall into this interpreted category. Um, uh, in addition to which, um, we're also going to talk about frameworks tonight. Um, so um, frameworks is sort of a, a broader set of tools and techniques that are built with a language. Um, so you can kind of think this is you can kind of think of this as like a dialogue or sorry a dialect of a language. Um, so you have you know you have you have English and you have you know uh, Southern dialect and New England dialect, and they both have different rules for how you would say things and how you communicate with them, but they're both grounded in the same language. Uh, in addition to which, a term we're probably going to hear quite a bit tonight is something called object-oriented. Um, this is uh, a, a philosophy and a design, uh, a language and language design that sort of swept the world in the, starting in the 70s and 80s and has since gone on to be kind of a dominant philosophy in language design. Um, the basic idea is that everything in a language is made up of objects that communicate with each other. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later as we're exploring both Python and Ruby because they're both object-oriented languages. Um, and then the last two there are just two different programming styles. Um, there's functional programming, um, uh, which is a programming, a type, of, uh, a type of programming that avoids state changes and immutable data, and then there's imperative programming, um, which uses statements to change a program state. So these are just two different approaches um, to programming. Um, and the reason why this is important is because um, for a long time, there used to be kind of a division between these two, and both Python and Ruby managed to blend them together into one language. So, um, you know, all this is kind of going into what's making Python and Ruby unique languages that are fun to write and productive for developers to use. Cool. I love I love the comparison of like a framework to a dialect. I think that's really smart. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that's often really confusing when you're when you when you're first approaching. When, first of all, when you're first approaching coding, there's just so much jargon and so much uh, you know, so many like so many buzzwords and stuff. But language versus framework is one of the early ones that gets really confusing. Totally. Okay, cool. So we're gonna move back to move forward. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is um, this is kind of a brief side by side comparison of Ruby and Python, um, and um, and it's, so it's basically into the the philosophy of both of them. They both came around in the in the mid '90s. Um, Python actually predates Ruby by, I think, about four years. Um, we'll get into more detail on that in the, on the specific Python slide. Um, but they both sort of came around to, 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 be, um, to address needs in the, in the programming community. Um, their philosophies are different. In Ruby, the philosophy in the languages, there's more than one way to do the same thing. Where in Python, it's, there's a most understandable way to do something, and that is how it should be done. Mm -hmm. So you'll often see in, in Ruby that there's multiple different uh, methods or approaches to solve the same sort of problem. And then you'll see in Python um, that there's one approach. And so it's, it's a kind of a very philosophical difference that looks at, um, and the, the thing that unites them is the goal is to write clean, uh, clean readable, concise code, um, but they just have different ways to, to, to make that approach. Um, they're both object-oriented languages. Um, they're both dynamic. Um, they both um, have a lot of uh, different functionality. Like they're very flexible languages. Um, you can see just a, a brief list of some of the projects built in Ruby include Hulu, Twitter, Zendesk, Basecamp, Shopify, Urban Dictionary. 
um, and GitHub. And then Python has really been taken on by Google um, as one of their primary languages. So Google, Yahoo Maps, YouTube, um, uh, Dropbox, and um, Venmo are all examples, um, or just like you know, a few of the examples of stuff that's been written in Python. Ben, can you, what does general purpose language refer to? Yeah, so general purpose language refers to, and both Ruby and Python fall into this category. Mm -hmm. um, some languages have specific uses. Um, they're specifically tailored for, um, for a, a certain use case. So for a good example is a language called R, which is mm -hmm. primarily used for statistical analysis. Um, it's very heavily used in the academic world. Um, and anywhere you're going to be really doing really heavy duty uh, math with statistics and uh, you know breaking into into different co correlation and causation there, um, you'll probably use R as your primary language. Um, other another example is something called is something like SQL, which is a database language. It primarily exists to interact with the database. So you wouldn't write a web application with it. Um, both Ruby and Python, by general purpose, it means that they're they're really flexible and you can do just about anything with them. Um, you know you can you can uh, talk to a database with Ruby or Python, or you can build a web application, or you can build you know, a, a script for your own computer to run on its own, um, or you can run almost all of Google's internal tools, which is what they do with Python. Cool. All right, so we're going to start with Ruby. Yeah, so Ruby was created in 1995 um, by a gentleman um, who just commonly goes by Matt's. Um, it's 100% object oriented. So a lot of languages um, are object oriented, um, but they still have like primitive data types. So they'll have mostly everything as an object, um, but not. But but they'll still have like you know exceptions for like integers or maybe characters or something. In Ruby, absolutely everything in the language is an object, which means that everything operates in the same paradigm of uh, sending and receiving messages and, and possessing state. Um, so you basically are, are giving instructions to different objects in your language, and they're fulfilling different tasks for you. Um, the thing that really distinguishes Ruby and has you know, made it a really popular language is that its core philosophy focuses on humans, and on, on humans, uh, and, on, on, and it cares about how humans program. Um, Matz is actually has, uh, he has a really cool thing that, he's, that he talks about this, where he basically says uh, computers the languages should be designed for people to use because mm -hmm. people are the masters, computers are the slaves, not the other way around. And so um, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like a breaking point in the development of languages, but it is a significant point because he specifically went to design a language that was very friendly for humans to use mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being very friendly for a machine to understand. Um, another core part of Ruby's philosophy is it follows the principle of least astonishment. Um, and this is kind of a fancy way to say that like, uh, when you learn how to do something new in Ruby, you should, be, you should be the least surprised as possible. So if you have an array or something, or, you know, and you, or how you print something out on the screen, um, the way you do it should be very unsurprising. Um, and you'll see this a lot with the way that Ruby approaches different things. Uh, stuff sounds like English, um, or it sounds like plain language. You know, it doesn't have uh, a technical or a coding feel to it. It has a very sort of conversational feel. Um, and it makes it for just a very friendly and a very enjoyable language for beginners and advanced programmers to, to, to write in. Um, so kind of this is all sort of leading to, like, if you're a beginner, why should you start with Ruby? Um, it's a high-level language. Um, we've said high level before, and what that basically means is that um, it's abstracted away from you know the sort of the the, the hardware of the computer. Like you you can um, you can speak in terms that are more uh, more human and less computer oriented. Um, it's a very enjoyable language to write. It's general purpose, which means um, it has a lot of applications, and now it's, it's which allows it to span a lot of industries. So it's, there's a lot of different sort of uh, potential applications with Ruby. It's not just limited to um, you know one set of skills. Um, it's also very popular with startups. Um, this it's um, this is going to tie into the Rails framework, but Ruby and the Rails framework have become very popular languages for uh, quickly developing products and quickly starting up uh, companies and stuff. So um, it's very popular in the startup scene. Did you learn Ruby first, Ben? I did. Yeah, uh, Ruby was the was my so um, I when I was uh, so in school I I, I was primarily learning Java because that's mm -hmm. a pretty standard learning language for universities. You were a CS major, right? I was a CS major. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, but my first job out, I was I became a I, I was responsible for doing Rails development. So I learned Ruby and I learned Rails, 
Um, and then the second, the next place I worked, um, we were a we were a Rails and Django shop, so we both did Ruby and Python. So I picked up Python there. Cool. Cool. So it's always going to be my first love for a language because it was the first language I got to really choose to learn. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, this is an example of how simple Ruby is. Um, so this is um, the kind of the most infamous program that you can, or the most famous program to write in any language is, is Hello World. Um, this is just getting the getting your program to print out a string to the console or to whatever that says Hello World. Um, and this is Ruby's Hello World link, uh, Hello World program. It's one line. Um, it just says puts Hello World, um, and that's. Um, you know that's pretty fantastic. Uh, I think the you know the the Java version is like five or six lines. The C version is, is longer than that. Um, so this is an example of how Ruby is very very uh, very very human friendly. Cool. So yeah, so this is um, so it's almost impossible to talk about Ruby without talking about Rails. Um, Rails is a Ruby framework. Um, in some ways, Rails has become Ruby, like you know, it's 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 uh, if you meet a Ruby developer, they're probably also working in Rails. They're probably a Rails developer. Mm -hmm. uh, part of this is because just of the sheer popularity popularity of the Rails framework. Um, it's uh, a pop. It's a very popular framework. It's gotten a lot of use, um, and Ruby has you know kind of come to exist primarily as uh, a service to the Rails framework. Um, some of the things that make Rails the Rails framework unique is a strongly opinionated framework favoring convention over configuration. And what this means is that um, unlike Ruby, which thinks that there are many ways to do things, Rails thinks very strongly as far as web development is concerned. Mm -hmm. There is a best Rails way to do things. And if you do if you build your application using that sort of convention that Rails favors, um, it will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, if you try to buck that convention and go your own route, um, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Um, and so this is one of the reasons, and this leads directly into the next point, which is fast prototyping. Um, Rails convention, uh, uh, Rails, uh, the Rails conventions allow you to really build web applications very quickly and to fast and quickly prototype things out and quickly get things up and running. Um, and as you can imagine, in a startup world uh, where startups are constantly, you know, pivoting to new ideas and having to implement features very quickly, this was instantly very, very popular because it allowed, um, it allowed. Uh, uh, it allows startups to really quickly, you know, iterate and develop new products and change the products. Uh, you, on the right there, you can kind of see the rate of adoption, um, and there's almost a million websites using Ruby on Rails that are, are using or run by Ruby on Rails at this point. Um, and you can see, like, you know, in the, in the it's still going up, but like in that early, very initial adoption. Now, what like, happened there in November? Yeah, 2007 or 2010, wherever that is. Yeah. Um. It's just like it was just. Uh, um, it, it, I mean, it, I, I believe that was around when Rails 2.0 was released, and it became oh, okay. a lot friendlier to use, um, and also just caught on in the startup world. You know, it just became cool. something that people recognized as being a very fast way to, to do development. It's a, it's a serious adoption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is one of my favorite things about Rails, and one of the things that really got me, and, and about Ruby, that really got me in when I first started, is that the mm -hmm. community is fantastic. There are some incredible, high-quality uh, official documentations, uh, documentation, and then um, uh, secondary sort of like uh, uh, learning materials that have been created and um, and and are uh, supported continuously. That just make Rails an incredibly friendly, incredibly open community. Um, it's it's rooted in open source, which means it's lots of people that are collaborating and helping each other with projects. And philosophically, they all really believe that's important. Um, here are just, you know, here's like four standard, the, the Rails guide, the Ruby docs, RubyConf, and RailsConf. And like, um, so the last two are conferences. They're fantastic. If anyone ever gets a chance to go, they should definitely, you know, if it's in your city or whatever, you should definitely go to it. Um, it is just a community that's that from the very beginning um, has been very open and very welcoming to beginners and very welcoming to developers of all skill sets. How legit do you have to be to speak at RubyConf or RailsConf? I've heard of actually like boot camp students applying at least to, to speak at conferences. Like, 
Is that typical? Yeah, RubyConf and RailConf are the big ones at this They're point. They're pretty big. Okay. Um, so like, you'd have to have. I mean, but if you have something like you have something uh, interesting to say and something that mm -hmm. you know doesn't fit within, you know, isn't being addressed or something, then um, I, there's definitely going to be a place. Especially, you know, if you, um, I would say as a student, like, you know, something from a student perspective would definitely be welcome in either of those conferences. Um, yeah. But again, like the the time, like, the Rails community is still relatively young. Um, you know, it's about eight years old in total. So, you know, a year or two of experience is, you know, puts you up there with um, as much experience as many developers. So it really is a, a, a it really is a community that's very welcoming. Awesome. Okay, I know this is something that a lot of people consider when they're choosing a future career. So, what's the job market like for Ruby developers? Yeah, so this is an example. Um, this is kind of comparing it to Python and to PHP and to Java. Mm -hmm. um, you can see Rails and Ruby are the crazy uh, top percentage growth there. Um, part of that's they're growing from a smaller base, you know, mm -hmm. so you're adding lots of developers to a smaller base. But um, if you look at this is this you know this sort of uh, data is borne out pretty well. If you go to Indeed or you go to you know you look at uh, language statistics on GitHub or or um, or Stack Overflow and stuff. Um, there's a strong and growing demand um, for Ruby and Rails developers. It's um, you know it's it's popular within startups. It's actually um, gaining a lot. It for a long time it used to be that Rails was just very much a niche sort of startup language, mm -hmm. um, but now it's gaining a lot of popularity even within um, uh, within larger corporations. I know that Apple does a lot of their internal support sites uh, with Rails, and that Amazon is the same way. So, cool. Um, when somebody's like, when you're searching for on Indeed or whatever, like, is anybody ever gonna um, list a job for like a Ruby developer, or are you looking for like Ruby on Rails developers or Rails developers? Like, would somebody you'll hire see someone? All three. Yeah, okay. you'll see this okay. as all three. Um, you're gonna see probably a lot more under the Rails developer category. Okay. Um, but you will see some as Ruby and then um, and 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 Ruby on Rails developers as well. Cool. I love this list. Yeah, so this is just uh, so this is a great list here. Um, the kind of the the bible for getting started with Rails is Mike Hartle's Rails tutorial. It's in mm -hmm. its third edition. You can buy a copy or you can read it for free online. Um, it's fantastic. Um, it's will basically get you started on your first Rails app and just kind of get you um, going on your on that on that initial sort of uh, application. Uh, Learn Ruby the hard way is also really good. Um, that's by uh, an author named Zed Shaw. Um, Code Academy's uh, Ruby program is is good, just like all the material. Um, and then finally, um, Blocks. I I help write the Block Rails course, so I I strongly believe that you know we belong up there with these resources because it's just um, a fantastic way or a fantastic uh, set of curriculum. And more importantly, through Block, you have a mentor that works with you, so you're not just doing this solo. You've got an experienced uh, an industry professional that's helping you. Those first three resources, I would think, like someone with very little or no experience in programming, would start with with the block Rails course. Like, do you suggest that people with like very little, no experience could start with the block Rails course, or would should they? Yeah, there's no before? prerequisites in the block Rails course. We have yeah. a set of pre work. Um, one of which, some of which is is on this list actually. Yeah. Uh, but um, there's no prerequisite, um, and it's really the, the the beautiful thing about a mentor-led course is that it is can be really sort of uh, set for any experience level. So if you're coming in brand new, your mentor will will calibrate the course for that. If you're coming in with you know two or three years of length of experience writing it in another language and you're trying to transfer that, your mentor will you know will recalibrate for that background. I love that. Cool. Oh yeah, cool. I want to see some of these projects. Yeah, so um, there's uh, you can go to um, well, I think it's uh, Block Alum um, and uh, see a whole bunch of projects that Block students have built. Um, a lot of which are it's uh, a lot of which are um, um, are built with the Rails framework. Um, mm -hmm. but these are just a couple examples here. There's uh, Jotly, which is like a note-taking application. Uh, there's Coder Match, which is uh, a really cool application that a student did that matches up students with, uh, or matches up coders that want to work together. Um, so if you're like, you know, you work, you're a freelancer and you want to pair pair with somebody on something, you can use Coder Match to kind of find a buddy. Um, 
and then there's a couple other ones. There's Travel Poker and Fuhrer, and these are just these four are just examples of what students have built at Block. So um, it kind of shows you both what students are able to do and what you can do with Rails in a very quick amount of time. So, what was the coolest when you were mentoring with Block? What was the coolest like student project that you saw? Uh, the coolest one I saw was uh, was actually a chat application. It was like a live chat, which is um, actually incredibly hard to do. Yeah. Um, so a student uh, built out this live chat application where you could go on and you could chat with other people and they could join. Cool. Um, yeah, and oh, if, and so it's uh, block.io uh, slash alumni. Is slash where alumni? Yeah, where there's a, there's a whole bunch of other ones there. So okay, cool. People are just curious what can be done in a very quick amount of time with Rails. Um, and you know, a very quick amount of time going from beginner to uh, to or going from zero to build, building your own stuff. That's a that's a good place to go. Awesome. Okay. Slash alumni, and then I'll include that in our follow up email also, in case Sweet. people want to look at that too. Yeah. No, it's it's fun. It's fun to see what people have built. Okay. Cool. We're gonna move on to Python in just one second, but I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment. Um, cool. Okay. Yeah. Drew says. Uh, block.io slash alumni. Okay, I just want to remind everybody that the Q&A app is there for you. Um, you can also tweet at Course Report um, or uh, comment on the uh, Google Hangout page, um, and we will try and get to everyone's questions. Um, okay, I've got... Let's see. Okay, I've got a couple questions. So... Uh, I guess regardless of the language that that a student chooses to learn, um, as as a mentor at Block, who have you seen um, be like the most successful sort of mentees that you've had? Have they all like shared something that made them like really crush the course? Like doing a an online course can be really challenging to some people. Like what have you what have you seen people really do? I think the biggest thing is to come in with, uh, you know, with the right motivation. Just to come in with a passion to uh, to learn, to pick up a skill, to make a career change. You know, whatever your motivation is, um, because coding is hard. Like it's gonna, especially when you're first starting, it's a frustrating experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's gonna be times when it's a frustrating experience, and you need that sort of overarching goal, um, or overarching passion to keep you going forward. So I know for some students. Um, that I had some students. It was they were they were they were dead set on a career change, and that was what was driving them. Some was that they had their own project that they were going to do. They had, they had a startup idea they wanted to launch. Um, one student was was driven by the fact that they wanted uh, they uh, they wanted to be able to, to teach their kid coding. Um, so they had two they had two daughters, and they wanted to to be involved with their education and be involved with their coding. Um, so just whatever it is, as so long as you have something to help to help to um, to help uh, drive you forward and give you that passion. Totally. Um, oh, I have a question. What are gems, and how do they apply to Ruby and Rails? Um, and does Python have like the equivalent of a gem? Yes. So um, gems are just a, the Ruby's word for a library. Mm -hmm. and a library is just um, a, sort of a self-contained chunk of code. So, um, for example, there's a, there's a popular Ruby gem called Devise. Uh, and this this gem allows you to do user authentication, so logging into an app, logging out of an app, creating new accounts, and all that sort of stuff. And it just takes all that code that you need and adds it to your application. Um, so Ruby chose gems because it fit with the Ruby gem sort of theme. Um, uh, Python oh, has an equivalent. It. Yeah, <laughs> Python has an equivalent, and they're called eggs. So okay. So Ruby's got because the snakes and pythons. So. Um, yeah, so Python's got eggs, and you uh, you can install them as well. But yeah, they're both um, both both Python and Ruby. Uh, their sort of third-party libraries are very very nice um, as far as the ease of install and stuff. Cool. Um, okay, we have a question from Liam who says um, we hear a lot about like the magic of Rails uh, and Ruby. Um, what can we do to make sure that we're like really understanding the language as we're learning it? Um, do you have like a stance on that. Yeah, so um, this is kind of like the, usually the part, this is the thing that Root Rails gets the, the biggest sort of bad rap about is it's too magical. Mm -hmm. um, and really what's being expressed there is that um, Rails, Rails opinionated nature and its uh, emphasis on convention, or, or on, or on uh, convention uh, allows you to really sort of get a lot for free. So you're right. able to write a few lines of code and you get a lot under the hood. Like you get, you get a lot that's sort, of, that's sort of just given to you that you don't have to sort of manually sort of set and do. 
Um, this is good because it's less work for the developer and you're able to be able to build more impressive things quicker. Um, it can be bad if you just sort of don't understand what's happening, you just sort of do it. I think the most important thing there is to work um, with a set of uh, material that challenges you. It doesn't, doesn't say, you know, enter XYZ and then go. Um, and to work with a mentor. This is one of the areas where working with a mentor is really beneficial because a mentor will basically be able to stop you and be like, whoa, okay, we just did that. You know, tell me what that means. Tell me what that is. Mm -hmm. um, and having, or, or you'll be able to go to your mentor and be like, hey, you know, I entered this into the terminal and it did magic stuff for me and I don't know why. And then your mentor will be able to really take a step back and explain, okay, here's what's happening. Here's what's Rails. Here's what Rails is doing for us. And here's what we're, you know, what we have to do. Awesome. Yeah, I think that that's the biggest thing is just to, um, it's an interesting complaint because it's kind of like saying it's too powerful, it's too good, um, but you know, you just want to, to make sure that you're really focusing on, on learning what you're doing it. Yeah, especially for a beginner. Yep, definitely. Okay, cool. So we're going to, those are a couple good questions, so we're going to hop back in to this presentation. Cool? Okay, so Python. Yeah, so Python predates Ruby by about four years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was created by uh, Guido van Rossum, who is um, was actually elected uh, dictator for life of the Python community. Um, he's elected a Dutch guy. dictator. Okay. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> Python is open source. It, there's no no one has any. And, and Ruby is open source as well. So no mm -hmm. one has. It, it's now been turned over to the community. Everyone has an equal say on the direction that the language should go and how it should be developed. Um, but in appreciation for everything that he's done, Guido was elected dictator for life of, of Python. So um, it's it's a benevolent dictator for life. I think it's his full title. Sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, the community is very grateful for what he did. Uh, it's less object oriented than Ruby. Um, in Ruby, everything is an object. In Python, there are primitive data types, and everything isn't necessarily an object. Um, but it's it still can be object oriented, and it tends to be object oriented in practice. So um, it is kind of a distinction there. Um, its core philosophy differs from Ruby, where Ruby believed you have many ways to do it, and then the primary focus was on developer happiness. Uh, Python is best summed up, summed up with um, explicit is better than implicit, so it's better to have things um, clearly stated, not hidden. Simple is better than complex, and complex is better than complicated. Um, so this is kind of the uh, the hierarchy of the way the Python approaches designing a language. And you can mm -hmm. see this in different aspects of Python. Um, kind of the most famous is that Python uses white space um, to actually do control flow in the program. So it actually uses white space is, is meaningful in Python, which isn't really true in a lot of other languages. So like if you indent things different ways, it has a different meaning in the program. Oh, really? Yeah, and this is kind of an example of their, their uh, explicit philosophy. So when you actually look at a Python program, the shape of the way it looks on a page um, actually tells you what is happening, tells you the logic of the program. Um, and so that's kind of an unusual, um, and, and this is Python's big controversy. So if Rails is that it's magical, Python's white space um, as part of its structure is always its big controversy. So um, I, I personally, when I, first got start, when I first got started with Python, I thought it was weird. And then I grew to really, really like it. So um, I think it's, it's just kind of something you get used to as you're, as you're developing. Um, if you're a developer who's interested in starting with Python, um, there's a number of different reasons why you would uh, be interested in, doing, in using it. Um, like Ruby, it's a high-level, powerful, general-purpose language, mm -hmm. uh, which means that you're going to be focused on sort of higher concepts, not just kind of the nuts and bolts and, and very low-level stuff like you know, characters and, and uh, putting integers and arrays and stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's very popular. It's very heavily used. Um, it's got about a four-year lead st or head start on Ruby, so it's got, um, um, it's been, um, it's, it's less, um, it's, it's less commonly used in, like, the startup world, and it's mm -hmm. more commonly used in, like, uh, it's, it's got a, a bigger uh, um, sort of, t uh, to hold into uh, more enterprise type stuff. So, okay. um, and especially is popular um, with C developers. So you had a lot of people in the, in the early 2000s, late 90s, who were old school C developers that discovered Python. And there's kind of a, a very vibrant crossover community between the two of them. How about in like big data and data science? Why is it so suited for that? 
Uh, yeah, so it's um, some of the, the the main reason is that there's a set of really powerful statistical libraries that mm -hmm. actually come from R that we were talking about earlier, the statistics code, right. um, that were ported um, to for Python very early on, um, and made it to be um, a much friendlier, much more enjoyable language to use than R. R is a little bit older, a little bit more crafty, um, but equally as powerful. So you got um, so you had it really sort of Python's very popular in academic circles especially in graduate schools and stuff that are doing mm -hmm. statistical analysis. Um, and it's these sort of powerful libraries that, um, that really got it to, caused it to become popular. Is that why people say, like, is, uh, because it has those statistics libraries, is that why people say that Python is, like, faster than Ruby? Um, so when you're looking at speed and stuff, so th yeah. the, um, um, that's kind of a, that's a, a, a different category of, of more like language optimization, so languages run at different speeds and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Python is faster than Ruby, um, but as you know, they're both in a category of, of interpreted languages. Mm -hmm. So your fastest language is always going to be the language that's compiled down and run like you know as as byte code or as uh, object code um, right on the computer. Um, both okay. Ruby and Python exist kind of a level above that. They're more abstracted. Um, it makes the development cycle a lot faster, but they are slower languages. Um, so the, you won't find them in use of, of stuff that, you know, that has to be screaming fast. Like, you know, you don't see Python or Ruby written on, on routers or modems or okay. and stuff like that. Um, uh, Ruby, I, Python is faster than Ruby, but at this point, um, for anything that really matters, they're, they're close enough that it, it's basically equivalent speed-wise to use them. Okay, cool. Um, so I interrupted you, but I think the last bullet point is that oh, it's yeah. So um, okay. this could actually be on the Ruby slide as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have experience in Ruby and you want to be and you want to learn pick up Python, you will find it to be a very welcoming, very uh, enjoyable experience because they are superficialities aside. There's many similarities there. Same thing going the other direction. If you're a, a Ruby developer or you're a Python developer and you want to pick up Ruby, uh, you'll find it to be a pretty a pretty uh, painless and enjoyable experience. So you started as a Ruby and Rails developer, but then got a job where where you were using Python and Django. How how long? Like, did you teach yourself, or did you? How did you make that switch? Um, I taught myself on the job, so it was um, you yeah. know, kind of learned as doing um, and. Uh, Python to pick up was was super quick. Uh, Django took more time because there are more differences between the two frameworks okay. um, than there are between the two languages. Okay, good to know. So this looks really similar. It looks really similar. So yeah, this is the uh, this is a Python program, um, and this just says it just prints hello world. Um, and again, like you know, you can see why both of these languages have a very well deserved reputation for. Uh, readability for clean syntax and for just uh, being pleasant for developers to use. Um, so yeah, so it's so Django is the framework that's kind of the equivalent of Rails for Python. Um, there's actually um, a number of other Python frameworks um, for web development, but Django is by far the most popular. Um, it's very similar in Rails in, in that it is the framework basically why you'd use a framework as opposed to just writing the code yourself, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you, so it talks to a database for you, um, it, it does, it processes requests from, from, a, bro from a browser, um, it eases the creation of complex data-driven websites, you know, so just, it makes that whole process of writing a website much less painful. Um, the big way that Django differs from, from Rails um, is that uh, Django does, uh, Django does less directly for you, so it's more sort of like um, you have to get under the hood more with Django. You have to really kind of uh, tinker with everything. You have to kind of manually create different routes and different things. Um, so it's um, part of it. It's kind of like it's it, it's more advanced, so it's more a little bit more it's a little bit more difficult. It's mm -hmm. a harder languages for beginners to pick up because or a harder framework for beginners to kind of approach because there's just sort of there's there's a there's a a larger amount of sort of uh, material that you have to cover before you start to feel as comfortable as you do in Rails. Um, the other thing that's trickier about it is that the uh, beginner resources aren't nearly as well developed. Okay. Um, the, part of this is that um, Python, so Python is Python has a larger user base than Ruby does. Mm -hmm. um, so you have people in Python that are that aren't using Django. So um, whereas you, Ruby's user base is smaller, but everyone who uses Ruby is going to be experienced with Rails. What is what are other frameworks that you could use with Python uh, aside from Django? 
Yeah, there's uh, there's Flask. Um, okay. There's um, oh, I, there's Flask is the other big one. Um, okay. There's, there's several other ones as well, though. Um, it's it's not that like the community is massively fragmented or new frameworks are arising. It's mostly that like you might be using Python just on its own or Python in some other context. Whereas awesome. if you're doing Ruby, you're almost certainly doing Rails. Awesome. Um, which just tends to coalesce all of the the help, all the material, all the all the beginner resources around uh, around using Ruby for Rails. Cool. Okay, that's really good advice. I like that. So yeah, these are um, we don't teach Python at at Block, but um, so we don't have an example of uh, student projects, but these are some some pretty pr prominent uh, Python projects that people might know about. Um, you can see there's a, there's several games on there. There's Civilization Four, Eve Online. There's websites that are pretty well known like YouTube and Quora and Dropbox, Instagram, Spotify, and Reddit. Um, and then of course the big you know sort of the the um, the the largest user of Python is Google by far, um, and they've really taken a lot of steps to support the community and to support the development of Python. So, um, you know, there's um, the, the, some of the best materials for learning uh, Python are produced and, and supplied by Google. That are actually their engineers when they get started at uh, Google use. Smart. Well, this Google Hangout is brought to you by Python. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so Python and Django both have large communities. Um, uh, you're going to see more, so you're going to see, like we talked about earlier, that, that Venn diagram of like the overlap between Python and Django. Mm -hmm. um, there's more that exists that are, are, are separate from each other than, okay. than it's completely overlapped, like, like uh, Rails and Ruby. Um, that being said, there's, there's lots of documentation for both of them. There's conferences that uh, go on for both of them. PyCon and DjangoCon are the two big ones for Python and Ruby. Um, yeah, um, it's you know they they have a very large, very um, sort of active community, um, and this is an example of kind of the the popular programming languages in 2014. Um, and Python is present in a bunch of different industries. You got social media, distributed programming, web application, finance, sciences. Um, uh, academia or academia is a big part. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, you know, grad, if you're a grad student that's doing statistics or economics modeling, uh, you'll probably have exposure to Python. Um, it's definitely a language like Ruby that's really caught on. And um, you know, I think what's what's nice is for both of these languages um, is that they are languages that were intentionally designed to do something elegant and beautiful and nice for the programmer. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been rewarded with people that are very excited about them, and you know, have been uh, well received and adopted. Absolutely. Okay, these are great resources. Yeah, so here's, so Google's Python class is definitely number mm -hmm. one on there. It's a series of uh, YouTube lectures mm -hmm. um, with uh, supporting material. Um, I think it's about like seven or eight hours of, of lectures and about eight or ten uh, different sort of complete lessons and stuff. Um, but there's also Learn Python, Beginner's Guide to Python, uh, Django Girls Tutorial, and Effective Django. And these are all, you know, great resources if you want to dive into the Python and Django world. Cool. Cool. Do you suggest that people go to like meetups, um, and even more than meetups, I'm thinking like Rails Girls or Girl Develop It, where you're, um, you know, like launching a, a full, you know, app like Ruby app and yeah, definitely. Weekend. That stuff is always worth getting involved with. Um, and there's uh, for both communities, there's local meetups all over the world. Um, there's uh, and all over the country, there's Python and Rails. I'm, I live in Boise, Idaho, and there's a Python uh, meetup that meets once a month, and there's a Ruby meetup that meets once a month. Um, so, you know, if they're meeting here in Boise, they're probably meeting wherever, you know, wherever people are located. Um, but it's 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 great. Even it can be a really intimidating thing when you're first getting started because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it feels it feels scary. It feels like you're going to go there and they're going to be like, oh, you know, I don't I don't know enough. I don't know. I don't even know what to ask. Um, but I think that for most of these places, you'd be surprised. Like, you'd go there and people are welcoming. You know, they're excited for people to be getting into it. They're, they'll have resources. They'll have advice and stuff. Um, you know, this is similar to what a mentor does for you. You know, they're, they're there to, you know, they're, they're going to be excited because you're a new programmer and, you know, you're joining a club. You're joining a special club that, you know, they're always welcoming new members. Yeah, totally. And it's, like, 
obviously a very exclusive club, but it's once you know how to do it. But I, I mean, people are super welcoming, and that's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Which um, language was is more fun for you? Have you ever like taught someone or mentored someone in 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 learning Ruby? I mean, in learning Python, and like which language has been more fun to learn or to teach? Um, I would say. I think that uh, I think that Ruby is a, a more enjoyable language, at least from, from a mentor perspective, to, mm -hmm. to teach and to learn. Um, and mostly that's just because um, it's just got such a it's so from for someone going from beginner to with absolutely no experience to picking up a language, it's by far one of the friendliest because it's just got such a easy like it's, it's so easy to see how it, it um, goes from English to code. Um, oftentimes doing that, or it goes from whatever language to code, like oftentimes making that translation from like the way people think to the way computers think is kind of a, a hard, difficult process. You have to kind of train yourself to think in a different way. But with Ruby, it's just a very natural, um, um, a very natural approach. And Python is very natural as well. It's just mm -hmm. Ruby is one step even, even closer. So, are there things um, that Python can do that Ruby like? can't do like when you were working at a shop that was using both Python and Ruby like did you ever have to like choose one language because like it was the only one that that could no, do No there's not really things that. that one or the other can't do they're both yeah. so general purpose that they can okay. pretty much tackle any problem. Okay. Cool. Um, there are things that they're I'm not even sure there's things that they're kind of better at there's things that both communities have chosen to focus more on mm -hmm. so Python um, um, the Django community has made a much stronger focus on asynchronous development, which is okay. uh, development where you have multiple things happening kind of at the same time, multiple requests. Um, and that's not something the Rails community has focused that much on. So, you know, kind of like stuff like that, like, you know, things that the communities themselves have sort of chosen to self-select on. Um, but overall, they're both so general, you can kind of do anything with either of them. All right, so next steps. For a total beginner, what should somebody do? Should they, like download something? Can they like test out both languages before they like make a final decision and decide to learn one all in? Yeah, so um, Code Academy has both a Ruby and a Python course. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be a great place to check out. Um, you can also, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a try, there's try Ruby that's, that's out there that lets you just kind of play around with Ruby and then there's, I think there's an equivalent try Python as well. Um, I would, you know, you can also definitely check out Blocks courses um, to kind of see what's available there. Um, see what, uh, you know, what, what uh, you can see. We have info sessions for that, so you, yeah. you're welcome to try to register for. You're welcome to register for one and probably hear me talk again. <laughs> <laughs> but more specifically about Rails. Um, okay. um, and yeah. Awesome. Well, anything else that we skipped over? I think that was super comprehensive, but anything else that you wanted to add, Ben, before I we wrap up? I can't anything right now. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Um, you were wonderful. This was really comprehensive. We went over, I learned a ton. I'm sure everyone watching learned a ton. Um, you've been wonderful in introducing us to Ruby and Python. Um, I will go ahead and post links to this video recording um, of the webinar on the Course Report blog, and it'll, of course, be on our YouTube. Um, and I will also include contact information for Ben and for Block. Uh, tell us in the comments section if you liked this webinar, what you want to see in the next live Q&A. We, we do them almost weekly. Um, and if you're interested in taking a block class, remember to use promo code CR200 and you'll get $200 off of your tuition to your next apprenticeship. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, Ben. Thank you.